I'll just go ahead and get started while Josh is setting up. So Josh and I are both uh, atomic physics grad students. Um, he's still a grad student, I recently graduated. And about uh, a few months ago, we got really excited by using GPT-4, ChatGPT, to help us out with research. And we wanted to see if we could build something that would be a concrete, valuable tool for the research community to, hide it, to try to actually kind of accelerate how quickly we can generate scientific breakthroughs by specifically automating a careful and thorough literature search process through the entire database of archive. So not just like kind of one-off question answering, but actually carefully reading through all of archive. Um, and so we're gonna tell you about that tool here today and we have it up on a website, we'll, we'll show you in a bit. Here yeah, we're kind of interested in like, first thinking about like what parts of the research process at this point and into the future could be handed off to AI or LLMs more specifically. And then we'll kind of tell you about the parts that we think are most promising right now. And then um, we've also been building a uh, tool to do this, uh, the part that we think is the easiest, which is some kind of automated literature uh, search engine uh, to help physicists find the information they need. And then we've also been uh, talking with Wolfgang, and he's provided a certain amount of funding and support for us to actually uh, take what we've done and build it out as a service to offer to, uh, at first, the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms, so basically the atomic physicists at MIT. And then we hope to, you know, if people like it there, also generalize it to bring it to uh, all the other subfields of physics and maybe eventually all of archive as well. So maybe we can just um, start by thinking about how we think about the different kinds of questions that uh, come up in research, right? They start at the top. It's kind of a hierarchy of like gathering and processing information from very general questions like how to build a quantum computer all the way down to more specific questions like, okay, what has a certain professor, um, you know, been researching recently with a, with a certain kind of like two cubic gate or something like that? The reason these higher level tasks are hard is because they require more and more steps of like search and synthesis. So as we heard from Jan this morning, the process of doing kind of hierarchical planning and reasoning is not something that language models can currently do. And so we cannot actually attack the problem of how to build a quantum computer with a fully autonomous language model at this point. But what we can do is potentially some of these lower level tasks. So the reason we cannot actually use language models for hierarchical long-term planning is because there's a fundamental limitation of a context window. So you see this in the ChatGPT interface online. You have a finite size of the input text that you can put in. And that means that if your kind of context that you're reasoning about goes beyond that context, then you are just out of luck. Um, and this necessitates ultimately interacting with databases to actually retrieve information, for, for our example, archive papers. Yeah, so for it to really behave like a human, right, you'd have to reason locally within its context window, write some notes, come back and look at those later, right, do long-term planning, potentially collaborate with other agents and whatnot. Um, but even just working with the context window that we're given, we think that these lower level tasks and questions can actually be automated away. And so what we're gonna tell you is a, a way that we've figured out to, to hard code a few steps of that kind of low level synthesis and search that you know, can automate a subroutine that researchers and physicists to start with um, need to do all the time. Uh, and we can parallelize that and automate that and that'll speed up research in general and also just give you kind of qualitative access to uh, a degree of information which would otherwise be prohibitively time expensive for you to even endeavor to, to bring up in the first place. So to make this really concrete, something we're all familiar with, you search for something on Google Scholar, and it might be something pretty complex with like a lot of conditions, like you wanna talk about superconducting interconnects between dilution refrigerators, something like that. And what you do in practice is you just kind of scroll down, click open, read a little bit, move on, ultimately give up and think, okay, I probably saw everything. It's not a very systematic process. But what you really love to have ideally is a kind of an assistant, a human assistant, which is at maybe a PhD level in your field, who can read each one of these papers in detail with your exact question in mind and decide if it's actually something it should bring to your attention. So you spend your more valuable time and reasoning on only the things that are actually relevant to you as opposed to some kind of filtering process. Yeah, there's all kinds of problems with this in the sense like it's a great tool, but you don't know how far you have to keep looking. You don't know like whether you found everything you should have, right? There's a lot of clicking and scrolling and you kind of forget things that you were looking at earlier when you're looking at things later. So it's not very, uh, uh, there, there are, you know, there are things that could be improved on this. So we'll tell you about how we're gonna attack that. So the one tool that we're gonna use, which has been mentioned briefly today, is we're gonna use semantic embeddings, which allow us to kind of search within all of the actual text within archive papers for things that are really specifically related to a kind of complex topic. Um, and this is basically just a vector that represents the meaning of your text, and things that are similar in some kind of complex way are represented as nearby vectors, so you can measure the overlap and thereby find things that are related to your topic. So you can take your query and you can embed that in the vector space like um, 
we heard from some of the talks earlier today. And you can also take papers or pieces of papers in an archive and embed them as well. And then the closeness of the query to the vectors gives some indication of whether it's semantically similar. But this is in a complex way that's more sophisticated than what you'd have with keyword search. You can take whole phrases and kind of like look at their meanings. Um, and then in order to actually go ahead and start finding those papers, uh, we can start with papers that are closest to the query in this high dimensional vector space and work out. Now some of those papers are actually relevant to the query and some of them are not so relevant to the query. But the language model, even with its small finite context window, it does have the ability to look at the content of the papers and the query and make an informed judgment about that. And it actually can do that very well because you're just asking it for a general evaluation. Like is this you know, part of a paper about this query? Is it related at all or not? For example, if you ask me about some biology paper, is it about some topic, I might not know how to answer a question that's like a detailed technical question, but I can, I can understand if it's about T cells or something, right? And GPT-4, for example, is extremely good at that. So it can find these red vectors out of the majority of these vectors that are hidden in this forest. Yep, but those more relevant papers tend to be more clustered around the query. So as long as you start there and work out, you find a lot of papers quickly, and then as you start to keep going, you find relevant papers less and less often. So one empirical fact we've seen is as you kind of expand your search outward and you iterate through these papers on the x-axis, these are the papers we're checking, you have these discrete events where GPT-4 identifies a relevant paper, these black lines. And at the beginning, you identify a lot. There's kind of a, a cluster of these lines, but you get fewer and fewer results as you read later and later. This is like being on the fifth page of Google Scholar. There's just not really anything relevant anymore. Um, and this actually very empirically matches a exponential uh, model of discovery rates. So we can take the data that we observe, get some maximum likelihood estimate for the parameters of this exponential decay, and then we can actually predict how many papers we're still going to see if we continue to look further into the future. So for example, if we plot the integrated number of discovered papers, it beautifully matches an exponential in many cases. This is just a specific example. And these blue curves that we're showing are the predicted future trajectories, some sampling of them. And we can actually predict how many papers you would see in the future if you read the entire database, if you actually had GPT-4 go and look at every single paper. By iterating further through the database, we can make this much more concretely um, certain that you only have, say, one or two papers that you're missing, or you go even further and you're just completely certain, essentially, that there's nothing left. Yeah, so this, this allows you to have some kind of statistical idea of like, hey, have I found everything on archive that's about what I'm looking for? Like, have I scrolled enough and clicked enough? Uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. We can actually like quantify that and talk about how much you have to you know, spend in terms of language model processing to, to achieve that. And of course, it's gonna depend on the particular question and how many papers there actually are about a particular one, but this at least tells you how much work you have to do in order to find everything on. And I just wanna pause and, and point out like that set of papers, that 20 papers is a piece of information that's not really present in any kind of online database. If you have some specific question you think nobody's ever asked before, the only person who might know this set of papers is some absolute expert in the field with some intuitive knowledge. Whereas we can just spend some parallel computation to actually get that for you um, whenever you'd like. So we'll show you a demo in a moment, but just to kind of clarify in our heads what we're doing, you have a complex question, maybe some conditions, some like combination of ideas that you want to specifically look for on archive, and we're going to thoroughly read many, many papers. We're going to then decide whether they're relevant and give you the exact set. And then on top of this, we're going to actually add another step, which is summarizing and compressing a final report in an even more compact way to say, okay, these papers are the ones that are about a certain topic, these are about some other topic. Um, so we'll pull this up now. And there's some more information on our website where you can um, kind of see any of these arguments that I've talked about today as well. Uh, yeah, so we've so far put together a demo which captures the last 20 years of all of uh, the quantum gases uh, subject within archive, right? That's something that we're more familiar with, so we could kind of like check whether it was working well on that set of papers or not, and we're hoping to expand. But we'll show you what that works like. If you actually go to undermine.ai, you can see a little explanation of, you know, uh, kind of most of what we're discussing here. Uh, and then you can also go up and you can click on demo. If you do that, that'll take you to a page where we've just listed a series of uh, example, almost like mini review articles that we've generated in the way that we just discussed. So we can click on one of those. And it takes maybe a few dollars of language model costs and a few minutes to produce this article. Uh, but what it does is it shows the same kind of plots before where we've read through a whole bunch of papers and eventually like saturated. So we found almost everything related to this query about using fermionic uh, properties of atoms to do some kind of quantum computation. And it's listed the articles that it's found uh, in order from most relevant down to least relevant and giving you a ranking so you can tell like roughly how relevant it is. And also you can sc uh, uh, scroll down and, and see the less relevant ones as well. Uh, for each article, it'll actually give you a 
uh, summary telling you what about that article is relevant to your question. It's not, it's not just the abstract. It's about what from that paper can contribute to understanding something related to your query. It's reading deep within the paper the entire text or the pieces that are most relevant. Yep. So instead of scrolling through many, many pages of Google Scholar or something like that, all of the relevant ones are immediately right at the top for you to look at. Then once it's collected all of that together and it has the body of all the papers that are relevant, we can further process that. And then the language model will intelligently break down that set of papers into different categories that you can look at and give you a summary of the, the state of the field as well. So this is useful if you want to jump in and you're only interested in like a very high level description versus if you care a lot about this search, you might want to go into each one of the detailed relevant summaries. Yep, so you guys can go on the website, check that out, uh, look at some other similar examples as well if you'd like. And one other thing to mention, we have this waitlist uh, link on the website as well if you want to tell us what you'd be interested in us uh, applying this to next beyond quantum gases, things like that. So we'll summarize here quickly what we think this is most useful for. Um, one obvious thing is if we load up all of, say, a very large set of physics-related research, like all of the physics archive, now you could do exhaustive search for very broad topics, very specific topics, whatever you want. Um, for example, if you're trying to propose a new research topic and you want to make sure nobody's done this before, you would be able to, with pretty high certainty, say there's just no papers in this database that are related to this combination of topics. Or if you have a new student and you're trying to bring them on board, you might want to hand them a set of like 50 papers with a specific little summary about each one and why you might want to know about it and have them, instead of figuring out what they should look at, you just prepare them this database and you pass it to the next new student every time. Um, yeah, we're also hoping to build this platform for the CUA uh, where we're going to have everyone be able to save the results. You can share them. Hopefully people can you know, search queries that are relevant to their research programs and then have others, grad students in the lab, look at them, cross-reference them, uh, all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, like I said, we're currently building this out for the CUA, uh, but uh, please do sign up for the wait list. For, you know, we'd like to expand it to other um, uh, parts of our archive as well. I also want to hear if you have any ideas about how to extend this further, what kind of tools we should incorporate. We'd be happy to hear. So thank you. Bye. Really fantastic tool. Um, we've got one question and then we'll move on because we're a little bit behind. Yeah, yeah, quick question. So I guess you feed it the LaTeX source or something from archive. So the problem here is, that, well, I guess the reason that you're using archive is because that source is available. So I mean, the librarians have been saying for decades that we need to stop using PDFs for papers. So I guess this is another reason to do that. But have, my, my question is, have you looked at any of the like better actual discovery kind of engines or whatever you would call them, like Inspire HEP or the NASA ADS, instead of using archive as the core of this? Because then you could get papers that were for, you know, from the 1800s or whatever. Right, this is certainly a limitation and there's a, there's a lot of difficulties with preparing the papers to then embed them and, and specifically look at only the text of the papers, right? So we don't have images, we have to decide between using the PDF and turn converting it to text or using LaTeX source files which are sometimes like completely disorganized on archive and can be quite messy. Um, I think our, 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 our kind of philosophy here is we want to know, you, you will be certain that the data on archive is exhaustively searched. So it's on you to kind of realize that there's not necessarily papers from 1800 in there. Um, and it's just difficult to include that in the database at this time, so. Yeah, we just figured we'd start with a database that was easy to do. Mm -hmm. And in physics, we're lucky that archive is basically exhaustive, right? Everyone will post a paper on there. So if you want to worry about, hey, if I build this new atomic physics experiment, has anyone done it before? If it's not on archive, it hasn't been done. So you're right, if we generalize to other fields, you know, this would be something to think about in the back end, but. Thank you.